Hello, my name's Kevin Large and I'd like to welcome you to the first in our IoT Security Raspberry Pi Emulation Lab Videos. This lab is Lab 1.2.3.3 which is Harden a Raspberry Pi. For this lab we're going to use our familiar topology with our Kali Linux VM connecting to the Windows Bridge via the VirtualBox host only adapter. The Kali Linux VM will be running a DHCP server which will offer out IP addresses and subnet masks to our emulated Raspberry Pis. Our emulated Raspberry Pis will connect via Windows tap adapters into the Windows bridge. I'm only actually going to be using Pi Node 3 for this lab. I've already started Kali Linux and logged in and I already have Node 3 up and running. The DHCP server is running on the Kali Linux machine. Um, this video presumes that you've looked at the foundation video so you know how to get Kumu working, get Kali Linux working, get services working um, and IP tables and things like that. Okay, What I'm going to do now, I'm going to type IPA to see the IP address of the emulated Kumu Raspberry Pi. It is 203.0.113.28 and um, I'm now going to log in from the terminal window on the Kali Linux machine just because it's easier to see what's actually going on uh, it's a much nicer terminal window so I'll do a quick ping 203.0.113.28 and we're good to go. I'll hit Control C to stop. Yeah, so if you haven't already looked at the foundational videos, uh, you need to look at those first before you attempt these labs. I'll do a Control L, uh, and then we will SSH into Pi Node 3 as the user Pi. So Pi at followed by the IP address should get us into Pi Node 3. We'll tap in the password of Raspberry. And uh, let's try that again. <laughs> R-A-S-P-B-E-R-R-Y. That's better. Right, um, and we're in. So we're now in uh, Kumu RPI 3 from the Kali Linux machine. We can test that by typing W. And we can see that we've actually logged in from the IP address 203.0.113.1. OK, I'm going to hit Control shift t to open a second tab on my terminal. I'll type IPA. And you can see there is a Kali Linux IP address of 203.0.113.1. So you can see that we are actually in the Raspberry Pi from the Kali Linux VM. Excellent. OK, now we're in the Pi. Uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to do the first part of the lab. But I'm just going to show you that things basically work quite nicely. Um, I'm going to add a couple of users. Um, so first of all, we'll use sudo because we need to have super user privileges, root privileges to add users. Sudo add user and I'll add a user called Andrew to the system okay so Andrew's been added with a user ID of 1001 a group ID of 1001 we'll use a password of QWERTY Q-W-E-R-T-Y and I'll just retype that obviously nothing comes up on the screen whatsoever not even little asterisks is I'll tap in a full name of Andrew Smith, my good friend, and then we'll just hit enter until we get down to the bottom there. Is this information correct? Yes. Now on Debian based systems, and this chestnut image is based on uh, Raspbian, uh, which is a Debian operating system for running on Raspberry Pis. On Debian based systems, the um, system IDs uh, for system users are always lower than a thousand and the IDs for 
non-system users, and there was users that you add to the system, uh, are above a thousand. So uh, Pi had a thousand. Um, Andrew's got a thousand and one. I'm now going to add the user Kevin, who should get a user ID and a group ID of one thousand and two. There we go. And I'll use the same password, QWERTY. Obviously it asked me to type it twice just to make sure that I don't type it incorrectly. Which knowing me is probably quite possible because I always have problems typing the password Raspberry for Raspberry Pis. And there we are, we've got another user on the system. Now I'm going to hit Control L to clear the screen. Um, I'm going to run the command tail minus 15. Tail shows the uh, bottom lines on a file, the last lines on a file, whereas head shows the uh, first lines, the top lines of the file. So tail minus 15 will show the bottom 15 lines of the file etc past wd. And we can see that we have indeed got the user pi on the system with the user ID and group ID of 1000. And you can see these system users now, things like the apt user for the advanced package management tool, which we use for adding software to the system, uh, the FTP user, the Telnet user, the DNS user, etc. They've all got user IDs below 1000. Uh, we've got Andrew with 1001 and Kevin with 1002. So we now have two users on the system. Excellent. Um, we don't see the passwords here, of course, because the passwords are not stored in the Etsy password file, which is a slightly strange thing. With a name like Etsy password, you'd think the passwords were stored there, but they're not. I'll do a control L. The file where the passwords are stored is actually in the shadow file, Etsy shadow. Now, the thing is, you can't look in that file as a normal user, because you do not have permission. Uh, what we need to do is we need to put sudo in front and sudo of course will run the command as the super user root and we can see down here we can see some absolutely crazy um, encrypted passwords now amazingly enough those uh, password hashes here these are actually password hashes um, they are for the same password, they're both for QWERTY, but you can see they look completely different, uh, which is not at all surprising because of the way the algorithm works. It relates it to the username and various other things, so they do come out as completely different. Um, that dollar six dollar at the front there, this identifies the cipher that's used for the password. Uh, so that's quite interesting in its own right. Uh, now, control L. What I'm now going to do is um, I'm going to set up SSH so that we can SSH into the system as the user Andrew but will be forbidden from SSHing into the system as the user Kevin. Okay now in order to do this uh, what I need to do is I need to do a sudo nano of the file that controls the SSH server which is etc ssh sshd underscore config and you'll notice that just about everything in here is actually commented out so it's not going to be processed uh, when the files read there's just a few things that are left uncommented what we do is we'll navigate down to the bottom of this file and we'll add a couple of lines and it's very very important that you type these lines very carefully allow users and it's users not user because that will stop the SSH server from running if you don't type this correctly so it's allow users no spaces capital A capital U then a space and the users that you wish to allow so in this case there's only one so we'll allow Andrew um, and we'll deny users Kevin okay because Kevin is a very dodgy character so we uh, we don't really want Kevin SSHing into our system and uh, what we'll now do is we'll do control O enter and control X 
and now we need to restart the SSH server. Now the only problem is I'm actually already logged into <laughs> the SSH server because I'm going in via SSH. So really what I should do is I should stop playing around with the remote connection, exit that, bring up our console window, and I'm just going to restart the SSH server from here. Okay, so uh, let's have a little look. We want to do a sudo service SSH restart. Okay, so because we've made some uh, changes to the configuration file for the SSH server, we need to actually restart the SSH server so it rereads that file and uh, makes note of what configuration changes we have made. Now comes the interesting part. Um, let's try to log in to that system as the user Andrew. And of course Andrew is an allowed user, so hopefully, uh, I very nearly typed Raspberry then, that would have been wrong, QWERTY. Hopefully Andrew should be allowed into a system. And there we go, Andrew's in the system. We're logged on the system as a user Andrew at a machine with a host name of Kumu RPI3. And if I do a W, you can see, yep, we are definitely logged in as the user Andrew from the IP address of the Kali Linux VM. Now I will type exit and we'll try exactly the same thing, but this time as the user Kevin. And we definitely don't want to allow Kevin into our system because Kevin knows all kinds of dodgy tricks. OK, so it does actually ask for a password. We'll try QWERTY. And permission is denied, so Q-W-E-R-T-Y. And it will allow you, ask you to do this basically three times, and then it will just log you out. And you'll have to try all over again. Excellent. So we have limited SSH access to our system. A good first step in hardening the Raspberry Pi. OK, so the next thing we're going to look at is we're going to have a little look at the use of the sudo command. Okay, so um, let's log back in to the system as the user Andrew. Because we know we can get into the system as the user Andrew. Thanks to the modifications we made to the sshd underscore config file. Okay, um, now let's have a little look at something here. Uh, what do we want to do? Um, let's just run a command. Um, as Andrew, uh, we'll use the sudo command. So Andrew runs the command as the root user. And we'll just echo the word hello to the screen. And it asks for a password. OK, it's now asking for a password in order to use the sudo command. So we'll type in Andrew's password. And it says Andrew is not in the sudo as file. This incident will be reported. OK, we'll now fix that. So we'll add Andrew to the sudo as file. How do we add Andrew to the sudo as file? It's pretty straightforward. It's simply a case of bringing up the Pi itself, because uh, we can't actually do this from this window, because Andrew is not in the sudo as file, so we can't run the command as, as, as a super user to add him to the sudo as file, because he needs to be in the sudo as file for us to run the command as a super user. It's kind of a chicken and egg situation there, so what we'll do is we'll go into the actual Pi itself, and we'll type as the Pi user, because the Pi user is in the sudo as file. In fact, I'll show you, there's a nice little way of checking to see um, which groups you are belonging to. You can easily use the ID command. Okay, and this will give you your uh, groups that you belong to, your user IDs, your group IDs. And amongst those you can actually see in brackets on the right hand side there, we're in the pseudo group. Or you can just type groups. 
okay um, and you can see that basically the Pi user is already in the pseudo's group so they can run commands um, if I type sudo groups Andrew we can see that Andrew is only in the Andrew group so we'll just quickly add Andrew to the sudo group so we'll do a sudo add user Andrew to the sudo group boom boom and he's done uh, now if we run that command again sudo group Andrew groups Andrew uh, we can see that Andrew is now a member of the pseudo group. Now, does this actually help us? Let's have a little look. Right. Pseudo echo hello. Ah, right. Let's try the password again. QWERTY. Andrew is not in the pseudo as file. Okay, so not only does he need to be in the pseudo as group, he needs to be in the pseudo as file. Where's the pseudo as file. Okay, I'll show you where the sudo as file is. This is the next step that we need to do. We need to do a sudo and we can do that as the pi user. We could obviously do this as a root user as well but um, sudo uh, nano the text editor etc sudoers.d and if you hit the tab key twice, this is a nice little trick hit the tab key t twice very quickly and you can see what's actually uh, the contents of that directory um, the one we're looking for is 010 underscore pi no password that's why Andrew can't do anything regarding sudo because he's not in that file so let's add Andrew to the file um, and we'll do this in two steps just to show you how flexible this is. Um, I'm going to use the uh, Control and K, which basically cuts a line, and then Control and U, which uncuts a line. This is like copy and paste. So Control K cuts, Control U uncuts, Control U again, put the line back in again. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put uh, Andrew. Uh, now, Andrew is currently set with no password okay so um, he should be able to run the commands sudo command and should not need to enter a password let's give that a try so we'll do a control O to write and a control X to exit and what we really need to do is we need to go back to our Kali Linux machine and we need to exit this session and then start the session again okay I'll clear the screen uh, we'll try running the command sudo echo hello and look at that it does work perfectly it prints hello to the screen no password asked for very interesting okay so uh, let's try changing it to ask for a password okay so I'm going to control L the screen here um, I'll go into the Linux machine and we'll do a control L there so as it's all looking nice and neat and then what we now need to do is Okay, so the next step is relatively simple. Um, all we need to do is go into a Kumu emulated Raspberry Pi, pop back into the sudoers.d 010 Pi no password, and for Andrew, instead of saying no password, we'll just get rid of the no. Control O to write, Control X to exit. Control L to clear the screen. Uh, we're going to a Kali Linux machine. Log back in as Andrew. Password QWERTY. Has a little 
little think about it for a while. And we're in. Now I'll do a control L. And then what we'll do is we'll try to use that echo command now. And it asks for a password. Yay! Superb. QWERTY. And it works. Okay, so there's your sudo. Uh, that's how we uh, can actually uh, harden the Raspberry Pi even further. The next thing we're going to look at is we'll be looking at firewalling, only we will not be looking at the uncomplicated firewall, we'll be looking at IP tables. So definitely have a good look at the foundational video on IP tables before you tackle this one. Okay, one little gotcha moment here. Um, I very nearly forgot to add the Pi user uh, to the um, SSH config file. So I've, uh, I've added the Pi user to the bottom of the SSH config file on the allow users line. Uh, I tried to get in as the Pi user using SSH and it wasn't letting me in. Because of course only Andrew was being allowed in. So that's how we do it space pi and now the pi user should be able to get in as well. Um, don't forget once you make that change you do need to restart the SSH server. Okay now um, this means that we should be able to get in as the pi user raspberry excellent okay safe again to log in as the pi user now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start some services. Um, before I start those services, though, um, I'm going to open another tab. Uh, and I can, you, I should, If you can't remember how to open a tab, it's real simple. All you do is you hit Control, Shift, and T at the same time, and that will open another tab. Okay, in that new tab, I'm going to run the nmap command. So we'll do an nmap. Um, and what I'm going to do is, just to speed things up a little bit, I'm only going to scan ports 10 to 100 on 203.0.113.28. And we'll just see what's up and running. Um, I should probably only have the web server and the SSH server. So that will be port 80 and port 22 open. Excellent. That's good. Um, now, uh, what we'll do is we'll open up uh, some more services now. So definitely have a look at the foundation video on how to set up services. Uh, what we'll do is we'll do... Uh, let's have a little look. Go back in the Pi, and we can do sudo systemctl start, and we'll start openbsd inet dot service, which will switch on the Telnet server, and that should work fine. There's no need for any modifications whatsoever to make that work. Uh, we'll go into the tab, we'll quickly run nmap again, and what you should find is you find that in addition to port 22 and port 80, we should now have port 23 up and running, which of course is Telnet. Excellent. Okay, um, now what we can do is we can go back into the Pi and we'll start the FTP server. Now you do actually have to make a change to the FTP configuration file in order to make that work. It's in the services foundational video, so I won't go over it here. Uh, VSFTPD. Uh, I think that's foundational video number 10, I believe. Okay. We'll run nmap again and we should have port 21 open for FTP and you can of course see these ports are open you can actually get through to these ports no trouble whatsoever because there is currently no firewalling okay so ports 20 21 23 sorry 21 22 23 and 80 all up and running 
um, just to prove that we are actually um, able to get in um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually before I do that I'll go back into the pi and we'll do an SS minus TL which is uh, TCP listening sockets you can see what's up and running on the pi so that matches quite nicely uh, with the uh, nmap output in fact if you put a U on the end of this TLU it'll tell you whether they're UDP or TCP which is quite nice and it will show you the UDP ones as well okay so so much networking you can learn using Linux uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all telnet to 203.0.113.28 and telnet's well for one thing telnet's not secure as we know telnet sends everything in clear text so it shouldn't be used it's also not very quick to connect. It'll take a little while to connect. Uh, there's a bit of handshaking going on. Uh, but then all of a sudden what should happen is we should get a connection. And there we go. And we can log in as the Pi user uh, with a password of Raspberry. And we're in. Uh, if we open up the actual Pi itself and we run the command uh, TLU let's put an E on the end for established connections and uh, we should be able to see any established connections uh, in fact what I might do is I might actually just remove the, uh, the U and the L and just use TE that's better okay so now we can see established connections uh, we've got a Telnet connection established, we've got an SSH connection established both from the Kali machine um, if I put an N on the end uh, we can see numerically port 23, port 22 Telnet is 23, SSH is 22, we can see our high high port numbers here, just dynamic port numbers for tracking the other side of the conversation all good Cisco knowledge there uh, let's exit a telnet session and of course SSH will just work anyway um, now in fact what I'm going to do is I'm going to come out of this SSH session also uh, because in a moment we're actually going to set up the firewall and we're going to set up a nice solid firewall so I'm going to do this from the actual window console window of the emulated Raspberry Pi. Um, now if I do IP tables minus S uh, we can see that we can't see anything that's because I am currently not the root user. I'm just going to do a little trick here I'm going to do a sudo su to permanently switch to the root user and then I'll do a cd to change directories. It just when you're doing a lab there's no harm being permanently the root user so I'll do an IP tables hyphen s and we can see that we have a problem and what is that problem that problem is caused by the fact that we need to set our IP tables to the legacy version so again if you've been following the foundational videos you'll know exactly what I'm talking about that's the next step okay so the command to actually do that is um, on the screen here it's about halfway up the screen you can see update hyphen alternatives hyphen hyphen set space IP tables space a user SBIN IP tables legacy again this is all covered in the foundational videos and now IP tables is working fine we could do an IP tables minus s to show the default policies that are in use at the moment I'll do a cl clear the screen just to make things look a little bit uh, tidier and we can see our default policies for the input chain, the forward chain and the output chain are all set to accept that's why of course Nmap shows all of the services that are running uh, we can scan the services on the Pi, no trouble at all with Nmap and we can also connect using Telnet, SSH etc um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to set the input chain by default to drop 
How do we do that? Really simple. IP tables hyphen P, which is our default policies, the chain that we wish to use, which will be input, followed by the action we wish to take, which will be drop, in other words, drop packets. So any packets going into the, the Raspberry Pi will now be dropped. We can check that, and you can now see that the input is set to drop. In fact, if we put a minus V on the end, for verbose, uh, we can see that currently the uh, packet counter is on zero and the byte counter is on zero for the input and uh, that's basically telling us that there's no packets and no bytes of data gone into the input currently. Um, now, let's see what happens now. Uh, let's first do a nmap scan. Uh, let's see, which window did I do that from? go. We'll scan that same Raspberry Pi which now has the firewall implementing a default drop policy on the input chain so all packets regardless of the protocol will now be dropped and you can see that Nmap basically has scanned all of the ports we specified between 10 and 100 um, and they're all closed. And we know that's not the case because we know that there is an SSH server, an FTP server, a Telnet server and a web server running on that system, but the firewall is blocking packets going in. We can't even ping that system. We try a ping of 203.0.113.28. You'll notice it's not going anywhere. Okay, so if we now have a look at the packet and byte count again. You can see that we've got a considerable number. We've got 188 packets have hit the input. Uh, it's 8,724 bytes. Uh, however, they have been dropped. Okay, so we now have an input policy of drop on the system. Um, now that's what you call a restrictive firewall. It's basically not letting anything through whatsoever. Um, what we now want to do is uh, We'll just set it up so as SSH can go through. So on the Pi, and now this is quite a long command to type in, uh, we're going to set up a rule, we're going to append a rule to the input chain. And here's the command. Um, it's a long command, so IP tables, minus A, append, in other words it will put this on the bottom of the rule, to the input chain, uh, minus P protocol TCP minus M uh, so this is our TCP module um, minus minus D port a destination port in other words the destination port is port 22 so the destination is TCP 22 which is the SSH server minus M uh, module contract um, so this is a connection tracking module and we're going to use the connection state or CT state uh, new connections or established connections will be jumped to accept. So any new or established connections coming in on TCP port 22 onto the input chain will be accepted. So we'll enter and we'll just run the command IP tables minus S minus V again and you can see what we've got up on there. Um, currently we have no packets, uh, no bytes on the input, which is default set to drop, but we also have appended to that chain TCP port 22, new and established connections, except uh, currently with no packets and no bytes. Let's see what Nmap says. Nmap minus P, so we're uh, basically scanning ports 10 to 100 on 203.0.113.28 and we can now see that SSH has an opening on the firewall. Now we could actually be even more specific than this with a uh, rule that we've just added. 
we could actually specify the uh, source addresses or the destination addresses or both the source and destination address to really tie things down. Um, let's see if we can get in um, now. Before we do that, something else I want to show you. Uh, let's just run that minus s minus v command and now you can see uh, that we've got 177 frames on the input that have been dropped uh, it's 8040 bytes um, and at the bottom there on our appended chain for SSH uh, we've got uh, four uh, packets I should say packets not frames there and 168 bytes. Excellent. Uh, so the only thing that really is remaining now is to try to do the SSH. Let's see, that's where we want to go. Let's just change that telnet to SSH. and we're in <laughs> okay so um, yeah you, you can you can pretty much do everything that you need to do in this hardener Raspberry Pi lab and in fact if you start looking more in depth into IP tables you can go a lot further the only thing we can't do unfortunately is we can't do task 5 because of the rate limiting um, I think that's related to the fact that um, if we do a uh, uname minus r, we can see the kernel version that we're using uh, in the Pi itself in the chestnut image. Um, however, um, when we look at the, let's see if I can find it. So is our kernel version here, 4434 Jesse, and that is the. Same version we got here, 4434. But if we look in the library modules for the kernel version, yeah. So uh, here we can actually see the uh, the module, and of, uh, this this module, of course, is related back, as we said, to this module here. Uh, that we got in uh, foundational video number one um, and I think where the problem lies is that uh, it doesn't actually match with the the lib modules so I think what would probably fix it is if uh, if this was actually compiled to match with the lib modules that would actually get task 5 working as well but you can do absolutely everything except for task 5 um, if we do a Alice minus L lib modules. You'll notice the modules in here are all 41958 which is a considerable difference from 4434 so uh, I think that's what was causing that problem um, with uh, the rate limiting uh, command uh, not actually working. Uh, but uh, yeah you can do 90% of this lab no trouble whatsoever which isn't bad going if you don't happen to have a Raspberry Pi anyway um, that's now run to 38 minutes so I'm going to call that a day for this one and uh, join me again for the next one <laughs>